Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 204 for Monday, August 1st, 2022. My name is Joel Duggan, and joining me as always is my friend Johnny, but you may know him better as Pixel Riffs. Hello, sir. Hello, and if you're listening to this on YouTube, are you listening with YouTube Premium? Could you recommend it to my good friend here, Joel Duggan? Because we've been talking about that in the render distance, along with the uh, relative kind of prices and uh, offerings of other streaming services. A little bit of chat about the Lord of the Rings Rings of Power series that's upcoming on Amazon Prime and the Dungeons and Dragons movie. If all of that stuff interests you and you want to chip in, then you can always listen to the render distance, the extended version of the podcast, by becoming a patron on patreon.com slash the spawn chunks. It is the first episode of the month, and so we always like to thank our patrons for their support as we roll into a new month of support on patreon so lovely to have you folks here thank you all so much for supporting us and patrons get to listen to the show live as it's recorded in discord if you're around at that time at least we can't always make the times available to everybody but we like to get as many people in the door as possible we've also got a chunk mail dispenser episode coming up later this month as well as our monthly minecraft hangout at the end of august and we just had another one of those the other day which should now be appearing in patrons rss feeds so great time to be a patron of the show yes thank you to everyone and uh really enjoyed that chat over the weekend with uh the different builds that we saw coming in from the community those are always really fun yeah seeing a lot of mud blocks seeing a lot of people using new materials mangrove wood all of that kind of stuff is starting to filter through into people's build styles now so great to have a chat and lovely to see what the community's been up to but what have we been up to this week let's talk about our minecraft lives uh why don't you go first joel what's uh, new on the citadel so this weekend I was able to add the details that I was missing from the Westgate blacksmith, uh, making good use of a couple of data packs that we use on the server from Vanilla Tweaks, the Armor Statues data pack and the Wandering Trades data pack, which gives you the ability to trade emeralds for mini versions, uh, mini block versions of uh, the blocks in the game from the Wandering Trader, which for us adds a lot of use for the Wandering Trader because as a late game server, we really don't have any other use for them otherwise. And so it'll trade you things like gold or blocks or, you know, um, mini barrels or mini chests, things like that. You have mm -hmm. to have the block in your inventory and then you trade it and you get it. Now, what I like so much about this is it allows you to create some stacks of items and allow kind of stuff to be uh, put around uh, as well as being able to give those blocks to armor stands, then you can then place them in different, you know, unique locations. So the first thing that we did was uh, finish up the forge and the work yard for the blacksmith. And uh, the forge was, I, I am pushing myself to remember that I tried to make Westall a medieval fantasy town. So I was looking up some different images from concept art. And one of the things that I noticed in, in someone's, um, piece of art was a, a forge for a blacksmith that had like double or triple chimneys and I thought well that's unique I should do that because I've not done that before so we've got a, a deep slate um, chimney to the forge but it's got like two smokestacks one little one kind of off to the side in a crooked mm -hmm. kind of way and then another one in the middle for no reason there's no real rhyme you know behind it it's just it looks cool um, and I used a combination of magma blocks and uh, shroom lights to create kind of like a molten uh, metal looking bit with some hot coals in the forge and this is where we started adding some of the things like putting a shield and an armor stand in the data pack and having it look like it's leaning up against a pillar i was gonna Hang say fr from these screenshots the shield is the standout detail of this for me i absolutely love the shield leaning up against the wall it's such a nice touch Thanks, man. And it, it's uh, it's fairly simple to do once you get a hang of it. It's a little tedious because of the way that the data pack functions. But once you kind of know what you're doing and if you can wrap your head around the coordinates and which way directions face, you can do it fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it, it, anything at an angle, as we've mentioned before, really kind of adds a lot of activity to a Minecraft scene. And uh, same thing with the sword hanging from a chain. Uh, it's just placed in the hand of a... Of a um, uh, armor stand and then position to look like it's hanging from a chain yeah. uh, and then you can hide the armor stand you can't see it uh, same thing with the small carved stone block that hangs from the chain of the bellows uh, which would help you know heat up the the forge uh, all that kind of stuff and then the mini blocks placed on top of the um, the pile of ore next to everything you know the ore that the blacksmith would then melt down again just because those mini blocks can be placed at an angle similar to how when you get like the skull of a of a wither skeleton then it adds that that extra kind of oomph and really that's the only like that one mini block on that pile of ore that's the only non-vanilla thing everything else is like uh vanilla uh iron ore blocks you know like the the raw ore blocks yeah plus yeah. like 
uh, I've got some some ore like stone ore, iron ore, and some cobblestone, and it just looks like a pile of you know metal and other related things. So it work, worked out pretty well. And then I don't remember whether this was my idea or somebody else was suggesting the smaller ore blocks to the things like redstone and gold. And gold and redstone, redstone in particular, looks like rubies. And so what I did was I created a kind of like a jeweling workstation inside as best as I could. Mm -hmm. And the idea being like maybe this blacksmith inlays gold or inlays rubies into the hilts of the weapons or different armor that they're using. And I have um, found a use for my drowned farm decorating the medieval town because drowned will very often drop chain mail armor, which you can't build. You can't make it. Uh, so uh, it, uh, at least as far as I know, you can't make it. Um, so being able to have chainmail armor hanging on the wall in the blacksmith shop look, you know, it kind of helps it look more, more authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, so we added some stuff in, in there. Um, same thing with like the black, the, uh, we've got a hammer that's part of the tables and chairs data pack. And I use that on the sign just to, on a, on a, uh, item frame just outside the main door. And it did, it kind of reminded me like, it's really strange that we have all these tools in Minecraft and yet we don't have hammers. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's it's one of the things that's missing between um, Minecraft and Terraria. Terraria uses a hammer to reshape certain tiles into different formations. So instead of crafting stairs or slabs out of something, you use a hammer on a piece of material and it flattens it out into a slab and it just kind of cycles oh. through different orientations for it, whether it's like an upside down slope or, you know, various options like that. But yeah, in, in, in Minecraft, we don't have a great deal of hammers because all of the... I feel like it, you'd end up using a hammer in a practical sense for crafting stuff. And so mm -hmm. there might be a hammer texture just on the side of the crafting table, just kind of like a cheeky detail somewhere right. next to like the kind of the tongs or whatever there are on the sides of it. But yeah, we certainly don't have a hammer tool that we can use in game outside of mods like Tinker's Construct or what have you. If not the crafting bench, I feel like there is a hammer on the side of the smithing table, the, mm -hmm. the villager smithing table. Um, yeah. But yeah, so just so we've got the hammer from that data pack hanging above the thing. And it, just, it really sells the build, I find, like, you know, clear communication on all fronts. Um, so that was just finishing up the blacksmith stuff. It was nice to get those fun final details in. Uh, there's still a lot of work in terms of foliage and path work around it, but I'm waiting for all the other builds to be done in the area before I start doing the paths because I find that if you don't do that, your path can end up clashing or you can end up putting all this work texturing something only to have to move it later if you decide to add a build that you weren't anticipating. So I'll leave the path work until, until the end. Uh, the building next door is a cloth merchant and this build kicked my butt all weekend. This is one of those <laughs> situations where I joke about roof floofing uh, on stream, which is like how tedious it is to try and get a roof to look right. And there was more floof than roof this weekend. Mm -hmm. I was up and down scaffolding, trying to figure out how the heck to do this. It is a single gabled roof that transformed into ha like being on an angle. Part of it is on an angle and attaches. So it was originally two different buildings that I made into one. And the wireframe that I had up there, I thought, yeah, that that'll work. And then at the last minute, I decided to add three dormers to uh, what I guess is the north facing side of it, which looked great from the street and made a nightmare for me on the roof to try to get right. So thankfully, it's one of those builds where right now you can't see it from anywhere but the ground. So uh -huh. I'm not too worried about it. Maybe if you get up to the tower, that yellow tower, you might be able to see some of the top of it. But um, it doesn't look the best. Uh, also, my choice in color, I, I'm regretting using oak. Uh, with dark oak trim and so the last thing i did on the end of the stream yesterday was was try to create a gradient but again like i'm only dealing with about six blocks going up the side of this roof so it's yeah. hard to make it look like a gradient when you can't really get too far with it so i may end up changing it down to spruce i may end up changing the top of it a bit it's one of those things where it, it has worked out and looks okay inside upstairs i'm actually surprised with how much i was able to pull off um, and not have it look like a hot mess indoors. But the roof so far for me, it just, I don't know whether it's the high contrast of the oak and the um, dark oak that is now highlighting what I feel are my mistakes, uh, mm -hmm. or uh, or if it's just that I need to just rethink the way that the, the roof is structured and add like a fourth gable in there and stop trying to like 
stay true to my original vision of an angled build attaching to a straight build. So I don't know. I, angles in Minecraft will create all kinds of havoc for you uh, as as time goes on. So just uh, be forewarned <laughs> yeah. for people that are looking to challenge themselves. Uh, past Joel was like, nah, future Joel can do this. And future Joel was just like, oh, yeah. why? <laughs> I, I tell you what you're doing right, though. I really like the stone foundation as seen from street level, uh, like down the slope that you've got, because oh, thanks. What, you've, what you've got is like the street level higher up around the other side of the build and it kind of continues while the street slopes down, the stone foundation starts at that level. And so what you have is, yeah, effectively the foundation kind of sticking out of the ground when you're looking at it from further down the slope, but it really continues that visual line of where the stone level of the street reaches around the other side of the building. And I think that's really effective. I've seen that happen in, you know, environments in other places, and I think that looks really, really good. So you've effectively got the building built on top of the street further up around, but then it, it kind of rests on the foundation for the, the other part. I think that looks really good. Thanks, man. Uh, and that goes back to what we were talking about last week, actually, about preserving the landscape and, mm. and that the, the landscape went up in that area. Like it probably just went up higher. And I when I plucked, you know, the the building down, uh, I just, you know, if they're all right, well, from above, this is the rectangle or rectangles that uh, this building is going to be. And then when I extended that down to the ground, I didn't like flatten the ground up to the building. I pulled the building down. And I think that that, you know, in turn, it's actually given us a basement. Uh, you can sort of see it in the last screenshot. But essentially, because this is a cloth merchant uh, or mercery, I guess, is one of the terms uh, that I've learned looking things up about medieval um, workshops and stuff. Uh, and uh, in the basement, which is unfinished right now, I'm going to have like a bunch of cauldrons filled with water, a bunch of um, banners hanging uh, and and maybe even have like some wool piled around. So where it's going to look like there's big vats of like either water or dye. I, mm -hmm. I might see what I can come up with. So, but I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't have enough room to hang all that kind of stuff without bashing the player in the head. Yeah. And so those extra two blocks give an extra two meters of headroom to the basement of of the build, which is kind of like the main working function of the building. So it all worked out. Nice. And we're going to talk a little bit more in our main discussion this week about what you need to do to design builds like this and where to stop in terms of detail and that kind of stuff. So more on that a little bit later and a lot more insight, I'm sure, from your, your West Hill build being brought to that discussion. Um, in the meantime, for me, I've had a bit of a varied week. Uh, we built a model of the treasury at Petra for a talk that I was giving at the Archeo Gaming Collective's 2022 conference. I was invited to this by Archeo Plays, who's a member of my community, who is a professional archaeologist, and they have various YouTube projects where they rebuild archaeological sites, play survival Minecraft from the perspective of an archaeologist, and it's all really fascinating stuff. Uh, so we did a talk uh, called Crafting Digital Pasts at the Intersections of Minecraft and Archaeology. It's a title that was designed to appeal more to the archaeologists than the Minecraft players, I think, but hopefully people got a kick out of it. That's now up on YouTube if anybody wants to check it out, and uh, a few of our folks who are hanging out with us this weekend in the Patreon uh, Hangout managed to get a preview of this because I posted a couple of screenshots in the group towards the end. Um, but we talked a lot about the preservation and restoration of Minecraft landscape and structures, kind of some of the stuff that we were touching on in our podcast discussion last week. Um, we were talking about documenting player activity on multiplayer servers, whether through, you know, the, the kind of stuff I'm doing on Empires, where I cheekily go and build a glass case around stuff people have found, or the previous seasons of Hermitcraft, where they've had museums where players contribute an exhibit that's more themed around what they're doing. Uh, we talked a bit more about world downloads as a historical record, and a bit of lore of the game itself about how ancient cities are the only structure with strong evidence that they've been used by different groups of people and that people have been there aside from the player and set up that campsite in the middle with the wool blocks and stuff who clearly weren't the originators of the structure because why would they need to set up a tent outside their own house? So there's some really interesting stuff in there. We don't touch on anything for long, but we get into surface level details of a bunch of stuff where Minecraft and archaeology combine. And if nothing else, you can see a time lapse of us building Petra in the background, which I think came together really well. Yeah, it, the build looks fantastic, and I'm looking forward to uh, to listening to the to the conversation. What I learned when we were doing the the kind of research for this, because there is a brilliant website called the Zamani Project, I believe, zamaniproject.org. 
is the website which has 3D models and a lot of line drawings, a lot of sketches, photo reference, all that kind of stuff for uh, the sites at Petra. Petra is a much larger thing than just the treasury. If you haven't heard of it but you might be at least familiar with it from having seen it as the front of the temple that they go into at the end of indiana jones and the last crusade it turns out petra is a much larger location and there are lots of different sites around there that are of archaeological interest and there's a bit more of the same kind of architecture that sort of greek columns very kind of hellenistic architecture in some of the buildings and there's an amphitheater in one part of it and then there are other things which are various tombs and other other buildings maybe dwellings and that kind of stuff around there so really really interesting place um it's in jordan and again there's lots of really cool stuff to consider for minecraft builds or if you're trying to build an ancient civilization it could be a really interesting point of study um, so obviously taking some of that back to Empire's SMP, I'm currently creating a kind of mausoleum catacombs style build in the environment that I'm building in the savannah uh, around my ruins. And it's really meant to be there as partly a lore thing, imagining that a city like this would have had to entomb people somewhere. Um, but also it's going to function as my storage system. So I've got chests lining the walls in certain areas and it opens out into larger rooms that have a variety of chests. And while those could be, you know, the tombs of, you know, noble residents or families or whatever, what I'm actually doing there is setting up, you know, this is the room where all of the stone is going to be kept. This is where all the wood will go and miscellaneous chests lining the corridors up to them can contain some of the crafted materials for each of those sets of materials, that kind of thing. And so it's going to be a very different approach to my usual storage system, which is normally a lot of Impulse SV item filters in a very utilitarian line. Uh, I'm going to try and do things a little bit differently on Empires just for the thematic side of things. And I don't have any screenshots to share, unfortunately, because it's still not 100% done. I'm working on little redstone details behind the scenes. I built my first block swappers so that most of the time when you're in there, you can just look at like the, the stone floor and it looks like nothing is particularly different but on stream we came up with the idea of having a lectern nearby with a book on it which is kind of like a ledger of who is in each of the caskets uh, the double chests that are in there and we came up with like little puns for like the wood room is going to have oak and spruce and birch logs kind of stored in bulk there and so we were like uh we'll call this first one like we can say that dr oaksworthy is in chest number one and the birch family or the birches are in chest number two and chest number three is mr sprucington or whatever you know we just came up with some some silly stuff like that but then I remembered that if you turn a page in a lectern without a comparator, it outputs a really short redstone signal. And so I've got that linked up to a block swapper where if you turn the page to the blank page in this book uh, on the lectern, it basically swaps all of the stone blocks in the floor for the blocks that are stored in those individual chests. And, and so like it can nice. come up with a little marker like I normally have in my storage rooms so that I don't have to use signs or item frames or make it really obvious what's stored in each place. I always like that kind of stuff when you can try to find a cool like lore aspect to make a, an in-game Minecraft functional thing mm -hmm. seem a little bit more thematic or or work better with what you're trying to do. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to work on little details like that. And I also want to encourage people occasionally to come through and find hidden stuff in builds in my area. Like there are going to be some ways that they can find stuff that they can basically loot for themselves. And so I'm going to go and find maybe some ancient debris or something that's like got a little bit of value to to the average player. And I'm going to hide it in little recessive areas in my, my storage system. And so if they find a button that they maybe can't reach by hand but can shoot with an arrow if they crouch or something like that, then I'm going to allow people to come through and like take a couple of my resources every so often if they, if they need them. And I, I like the idea of incorporating some stuff like that. So there's going to be a lot more redstone down there than at first meets the eye, hopefully. Um, on the flip side, I've updated the survival guide to 119.1. Uh, I took some LAs to a beacon mine and used them to gather stone and duplicated the LAs in the process of that because it turns out taking one LA somewhere and then duplicating it is a lot easier than bringing seven LAs with you. Uh, so I will report more on that once we've uh, covered the news this week. But yeah, updated to 1.19.1, everything is going pretty smoothly so far. There's not a huge amount of new mechanics, but obviously a couple of tweaks that we can cover in the news this week. Speaking of the news, might as well just dive right in. 
Minecraft Java Edition 1.19.1 was released on July 27th. Features in 1.19.1 added LA duplication, tweaked Skulk catalysts, added chat trust status, new options for chat preview, and added the player reporting tool. Allays will dance to a record when played in a jukebox. If the LA is handed an amethyst shard while dancing, it will duplicate. Duplication has a five minute cooldown. Skulk Catalysts will now drop five XP instead of 20 XP. And in chat, the chat scroll bar has been moved to the right when typing a message. The signing status of the displayed chat message is shown with a colored indicator. The indicator will either appear to the left of the chat input field or to the left of the chat preview if chat preview is being used. The indicator will be blue when the displayed message is signed and the indicator will be orange when the chat preview is enabled and a preview is waiting to be signed. The background of the chat preview will also display slightly faded when a preview is waiting to be signed. A warning toast when connecting to a server that does not enforce secure chat has been added. The list of players on the social interaction screen now places entries for players with recently seen messages at the top of the list. Chat trust status. Messages that are not signed with the secure chat system or have been tampered with by the server will now be marked. Messages with missing or invalid signatures are marked as not secure. Messages that are detected as modified are marked as modified. The trust status of messages are displayed with both a colored indicator and an icon. The colored indicator is always visible. The icon is only visible when the chat screen is open. Hovering over the icon will provide more information about the trust status. For modified messages, the original secure text will be displayed in the tooltip. System messages, non-player chat, such as command output, are displayed with a gray color indicator. With chat preview, adding when sending chat preview option for updating chat previews only when attempting to send a message. To confirm sending a message, a second hit of the enter slash return key is required. The previous on setting has been renamed to while typing. In while typing mode, the chat preview will no longer display previews in the message has not been modified by the server. Chat preview is now enabled in single player and will display when using commands that have a selector substitution such as slash say. Previewed hover events and click events are highlighted with a solid background. In player reporting, it is now possible to report a player for sending abusive messages in game chat. A player reporting a message is required to select the individual chat messages that contain the objectionable content as well as the category of the report. This is to provide the best context for our moderation team to take action. This is accessed via the social interactions screen. Multiple chat messages can be selected for reporting. Additional chat messages around the selection will also be used to provide our moderation team with further context. The category of the report can be selected from a list of report categories. The report categories screen has a learn about reporting button that links to a help article. Additional comments can be entered to provide more details and information regarding the report. And for more information, there is a linked article about player reporting and a reporting FAQ. Both links uh, will be in our show notes this week. Suspensions and bans. The game will now show a notice screen on startup if you have been suspended from online play. The reason for the suspension is shown as well as how long it will be in effect. For realms, a message that has been filtered by the Java realms profanity filter will now be marked with a yellow marker. Players will be notified if the chat messages they have sent have been fully filtered for the one or more receiving players on the realm. On the subject of chat reporting, there was one brief Twitter thread from at Minecraft on Twitter, which I wanted to highlight this week because Minecraft were kind of laying down the law a little bit, speaking about their position after a lot of people have been seeing claims that mods can alter reports. Uh, and I will quote this in full, uh, quote, We've analysed claims about exploits that work in the final release of 1.19.1. You may have seen videos of exploit mods that claim to prove they work. 
A mod being used to send in a report does not mean that report is valid and actionable, nor that the tampering is undetectable. The cases we have seen thus far range from producing harmless reports of innocent messages to reports that show clear markings of having been faked. We will of course keep monitoring for any new developments. We want to remind everyone that sending in false reports is a bannable offence. Do not use these mods even just to try it out." End quote. So I know you've got more to say on the chat reporting this week than I do, but uh, I'll, I'll point a couple of things out to, to folks. I feel like the article about player reporting, which has actually been out for about a month, is worth a read. It's plain language. Uh, they very clearly state what they will and will not be doing about player chat reporting. Uh, and I think maybe more uh, of the player base needs to, to soak that article in. Uh, the one thing that came up for me, specifically while reading and parsing the, uh, the news for this week, Missing from this article from 119.1, missing from all three articles that we're going to have linked today in our show notes are visuals. Yeah. And I really feel like some screenshots would have been very helpful uh, to illustrate what we're talking about. And it, it it reminded me of when you and I talk about Redstone on the show and we're trying yeah. to explain uh -huh. what's going on with Redstone. And people are just like, I, it all sounds like Greek unless I can see it, right? Yeah. And I feel like that's the case here. So what we'll do is we'll point you towards uh, what's new in Minecraft 1.19.1 by Sly Slime, uh, who of course is the tech lead for uh, Java Minecraft and does YouTube videos about Minecraft updates. So uh, you will get some visuals in Sly Slime's video to accompany the show notes. So as you're reading through the 119.1 update uh, and release notes, you can also watch Slice Lamb's video and see what they're talking about uh, in a visual representation, which I think is, is an excellent pairing. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's worth looking at because, yeah, for me, I feel like the problem with this feature and the reason that it feels like it's been it's snuck up on us, basically, and it's been implemented all of a sudden is because the foundations for this were really laid in technical jargon, and I still don't entirely know what chat preview and that kind of stuff looks like. I can, I can imagine it, and I've seen a couple of examples of it happening, but there's a lot of stuff about chat trust status and chat preview that I'm still conflating in my head, and none of the change logs and stuff like that have really clarified it super well for me and i'm a visual learner typically like it like you were saying like i i tend to thrive on visual examples of stuff rather than written record of it so i will i will check that out and hopefully i'll understand it a little bit better um but yeah as far as chat reporting goes again i don't have too much to say because we've talked about this ad nauseum in previous episodes but i just wanted to observe that i've noticed the arguments around java chat reporting have now shifted a little bit to bring in examples of chat filtering from bedrock edition so bedrock edition chat filters currently have what is known as the scumthorpe problem whereby the filter tries to censor any words containing profanity or slurs as part of how they are spelled so a common example might be the word night being censored because the first three letters are n-i-g you can see where that's going um so effectively the way this would be set up is that they put all of the you know profanity that they want to censor into a text field with asterisks around it as wildcards and then the system will look for anything that has that combination of letters in that order with more or less anything before and after it to stop people just like key smashing and then typing something you know a, a piece of profanity in all caps in the middle of a key smash or something like that right um and so that's unfortunately led to a lot of times where the chat filters have prevented effective communication between bedrock players because of false positives and this is a great time to start a discussion about bedrock chat filtering but it is inaccurate and misleading to bring up those examples in reference to chat reporting in java edition uh, chat filtering like that where it censors text live as you type it does not occur on java edition with the sole exception of minecraft realms where as we've noted in previous weeks it can be switched off by the administrator if you don't want a chat filter on your realm and you're the admin you can turn it off i believe it's on by default but the realms documentation should have the steps to turn it off somewhere in there Furthermore, the Minecraft team has said that there are no plans to bring universal chat filtering or automated chat monitoring to Java Edition. That's mentioned in the um, the article that was linked on the post that we've linked in our uh, show notes here as well. The one that's a um, you know an article about player reporting. The reporting FAQ has that clarified there as well. So I've seen a bunch of people bring this up and say, "Oh, we're not even allowed to say this in Minecraft anymore." Well, yes, that's true of Bedrock Edition Minecraft. 
I find that people are using that as an argument against the chat reporting feature on Java Minecraft. The two are not the same thing. And, you know, it's a bad faith argument to try and represent them as the same thing. So that's the kind of argument that when Mojang is looking for feedback on this feature, they're going to be ignoring because it's not relevant to Java Edition and the issue at hand. I'll read a brief quote from that article. Uh, Can I get banned for swearing slash profanity? No, we will not be banning players just for swearing or profanity. The type of behavior that will get suspended or banned is hate speech, bullying, harassment, sexual solicitation, or making true threats of others. It goes on, but that's enough. Uh, yeah. you, you get the idea. For example, I can bully you, Johnny, without swearing, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> yes. I don't have to be vulgar to make you feel awful. Uh, and so I think that's an important distinction to make. Yes, uh, they also say in the addressing the player chat reporting tool, they're not using chat moderation bots that alter or delete chat on private Java servers. So that's, again, pretty clear about their intentions there. Um, I'm still keeping an eye on sources about falsifying reports, uh, because obviously that's the kind of thing that a modding community with malicious intent is going to try and find different ways of working around stuff like this. It happens. Uh, but it is good to see the official Minecraft Twitter account confidently stating that existing exploits can be detected. If nothing else, that would be an interesting study in whether or not that will deter people from even trying in the first place and the fact that using mods like that to clearly alter stuff in a chat report is a bannable offense should maybe give some of these folks pause for thought um the only other outstanding concern i will entertain as we discussed just a minute ago is the manner in which this change was introduced a lot of people have had the wind put up them a little bit by the fact that this was underreported at first the foundations were kind of laid in technical jargon it wasn't all really there in black and white until much later and i think because of the sensitive nature of the subject matter Minecraft hasn't provided a great deal of comp uh, concrete examples of why features like this are necessary. And this comes with the massive asterisk, of course, that it's difficult for a company to say, our game has provided an environment in which children have been exploited by adults who mean them harm, and still maintain a positive public image for, you know, this being a safe place for children to play. Um, I recommend, if anyone wants to know a little bit more about that and maybe doesn't want to dive into the specifics but wants a bit more context from the other side of this, from people who have seen incidents in which, um, you know, children have been exploited by adults and where Minecraft has played a role in that, uh, go to Stuart Duncan on Twitter. He is at Autism Father on Twitter. He's run a server called Autcraft for a number of years and has been monitoring the situations in which child exploitation has been a problem within the Minecraft community. Give those a read, and I would recommend not participating in the discussion surrounding that just because there's a lot of people, again, arguing against it, playing devil's advocate for the sake of arguing against a chat reporting feature that they feel might not be to their particular benefit. I think the benefits for people who are potentially vulnerable to exploitation far outstrips anybody's you know individual comfort when it comes to whether or not they can say whatever they want on their minecraft server they mostly still can um mm. but yeah i recommend seeing the other side of things a little bit by by going and finding Stuart duncan's thread on the subject because he's been speaking out a lot about that recently and i think it's very important that he does speaking of exploitation how are the allays being treated on the survival guide <laughs> that's that's an interesting segue but i'll take it um so yeah no i've i've updated the survival guide world as i said to 119.1 i duplicated some allays immediately just to have the you know the fun uh of you know throwing an allay an amethyst shard while it's dancing and and you know getting that on camera for the survival guide series and i'm finding it's a very straightforward mechanic almost feels too simple in a sense but of course for larger servers where allays can't be found easily or distributed fairly it makes perfect sense to have this be a fairly easy process we might see some evolution of that in future if you know the they want to change it up a little bit following some more player feedback on this and i know a lot of the player feedback about 1191 has been centered on chat reporting and not the allay mechanics so we'll we'll see where that goes i find that duplicating them where you plan to use them is really useful like i, I took one or two allays down to a branch mine to, to what became a beacon strip mine and i i figured you know it's going to be a bit of a pain getting them down there they follow you quite accurately so i didn't have that much trouble getting them around but if you're bringing them long distances if you want to take them out to um a badlands biome so you can help you they can gather terracotta for you for example then that's going to be a much 
harder ask most of the time um but bringing one la with you is much easier to keep track of like it's not like bringing six where you turn up at the other side and you realize you've lost one on the way and you've only got five so i think it's going to be a lot more straightforward to bring one LA with you duplicate it a couple of times before you begin the task and then you've got a workforce that's just hanging out there in that position and one of the weirdest things occurred to me while I was doing that was like instead of getting them back to their point of origin it might honestly be easier to either leave them there or just kill them (laughs) which is a really Mm. bad instinct and I think that's one of the things that's occurred to me is Otherwise, I'm just leaving entities just kind of hanging around my world in various places where it's almost too much of a pain to bring them back with me. Is that a good thing? Is Are they becoming like the villagers now where you just kill them when they don't have a specific use? They don't have the trades that you want? That's my, my main concern about this mechanic. And not that allays really represent any kind of real world creature. So it's not like the kind of cruelty to animals instinct is being bred into players. But... It, it troubled me that that was my first instinct when it came to what do I do with all of these lays now I'm done with this beacon mine area. So I'm curious to see how other people in the community are going to be using them. Um, I'm sure eventually some servers are going to be updating to 119.1 once, you know, mods like fabric and paper and everything like that are all available, then hopefully we'll see some people updating. And then we'll see how commonly lays end up getting used now that they're going to be more available to people. I know that on our server, Alistair has taken the adventure uh, and gone to get an LA. And I think he, I remember him complaining about the the long trek back because he had to go so far. Now, distance for us is different because it's a, it's a legacy server. So like we had, he had to go a long way to find new generated stuff. Uh, And, um, and bringing it back to his original location near spawn is a, is a long way. Um, But I, for me, the the hassle that I see in in videos and hearing from you about moving a laser around, uh, that has me thinking like I'm probably just gonna go ask Alistair when we update to one nineteen one if I can just duplicate his LA. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and bring it to the Nether Hub and then take it wherever I need it to go. Um, I on the flip side don't find myself really drawn to using the LAs for their function of collecting items and dropping mm-hmm. them in note blocks and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't have a big mind on the go. I don't at present have anything that would require the LA to filter that I can't do faster and easier with with a system that sorts things out. Um, The one occasion where I can see it being a little bit more useful would be something like maybe the nether where it's harder to move items around uh, or a system that has something like a non-stackable item that you need to grab. But the problem is I don't have any non-stackable item farms and those that I do, the non-stackable items are garbage and I don't want them. So yeah. I don't need the LAs to pull them out. I just don't pull them out and then they just fire them into a trash can at the end. Yeah. So yeah, like it's so the trouble of moving them around to me is not really balanced with their functionality. Now, on the flip side, from a creative standpoint, if I had say something like, I don't know, a fairy house in the woods I think it would be really cool to have a couple of LAs flying around. And if you use the redstone of their mechanics to constantly have them kind of flutter from one point to the next to kind of create the illusion that they live near this house and they're kind of flying around doing their own thing. That's really cool. And like, and Mm -hmm. that would take some time to set up, but that, that is a one thing I can see them being used for. uh, And specifically that I could be using them for. I'm just not at that stage yet. So I can't say that I'm super hyped about, um, about the LA. Uh, and I I do find that the duplication mechanic is kind of easy. Yeah, and I, yeah. I guess in a way that's kind of to balance how far you have to go to get them and the trouble of moving them around. But like I have a really large geode that I made uh, a farm out of with a large water collection underneath it. And I don't build with amethyst. So I have stacks of of amethyst crystals. I could mm-hmm. make a lot of allays. So now that we have one on the server, they're kind of expendable, right? Mm-hmm. It's and, and I agree with you. It's not the best way to think about that. You don't feel good thinking like, oh yeah, these cute little fairies are just kind of like flies. We can just, you know, remove them and get more. Swat them whenever you want to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like it just, it's, yeah, it's, it doesn't make them, they don't feel as special as they first did when they brought them on the scene, I think. Yeah, and I, I think that's really just a problem with, like, you can't balance things for single-player worlds and then multiplayer worlds with potentially hundreds of players. It's it's right. so tricky. Yeah, and very tricky. I, yeah, I, I think I think the the fun to be had with the lays is is just that it's fun. It's like if you, you don't need to use them for anything in particular, but you can use them for item collection and stuff like that if you want to. I had them collecting all of the stone 
amethyst, gravel, diorite and stuff I was pulling out of the ground. I just filled up my inventory with other blocks and only allowed ore blocks into my inventory when I found those and silk touched those. And it was really fun having the cleanest strip mine because I didn't have to worry about going and emptying my inventory every so often, like throwing all of the stone into shulker boxes. I set up a shulker box loader and had them load it for me. And that turned out to be a really good solution. I, I really liked that. It wasn't necessary because I could have just done what I usually do with beacon strip mines and collect all of the stuff from the ground myself. But it was, in a way, really nice to know that they were going to get absolutely everything and I wouldn't have to like run back into that corner to pick up the one stone that I missed while I was over there before it despawned and and it's it's kind of fun it's it's neat to use them for little things like that they make tasks easier or they allow you to focus on one element of a task while they focus on others and I think they're at their best in single player worlds because they are effectively useful company it's as though you have a couple of other players who are running around and picking up those blocks for you so you don't have to and I like that about them yeah, I think their speed at which they move and collect things is something I will say is a, is a positive in that column. I think what pulls me back from them is how inaccurate they are when they throw things at the note block still. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's one of those things where I've had to design things for a lay error <laughs> occasionally. Like, you have the note block sticking out of the ground with a hopper minecart in it so that anything that gets thrown right. in that vague area mm -hmm. is picked up. Or you have the you, you you can you can see them doing the kind of trial and error thing of like they'll throw a bunch of blocks onto the note block or nearby and then they'll realize oh wait there are blocks dropped on the ground and then they'll try again and usually on the second or third try they'll get it right and as long as that doesn't slow them down from a task that is time sensitive then usually you don't need to worry too much about it but as far as what they were able to collect they were able to collect everything that I was mining from a a haste two beacon mine so. You know, I was producing dropped blocks pretty fast there, and they were keeping up. So you had each allay programmed for a different block? In the end, I had three collecting stone, which I think might have been too many. Um, so I, I switched that to two, and then I had one for andesite, one for gravel, one for diorite. And I don't think I even mined any diorite at that point. I was keeping the granite blocks so that I could block off any caves that I ran into because I was concerned that if caves oh, opened yeah. up and a lay was going to fly in. They're usually actually pretty good at getting back to the player, even through like pathfinding through caves and stuff like that. But I just didn't want to risk it at that point, which was weird because I could have just duplicated another one. <laughs> but it's, again, like trying to feel some compassion and to try and take care of these things whilst also having them work for you is a, an interesting balance to strike. I think they're probably useful in situations like um, Seshi Summons in our chat is pointing out things like chopping trees where it's hard to collect the items. Yeah. I mean, like if you've got an automated farm where you can collect things like sugarcane with water and pistons and that kind of stuff, that's pretty standard. Whereas you, ha you have to run around and collect the blocks from the trees that you chop down. There's not really an easy way to do all that kind of stuff. Even with tree farms, you're still... I guess you can use TNT, but then that requires you to have, you know, a lot of TNT on hand. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that if you are dealing with like that kind of bridge between manual and well, for example, if you're if you're not duping TNT, then you have to create the TNT manually. So there's a finite, you know, resource there. Whereas if you're using an allay to collect the wood blocks instead, then they're just going to keep on going. So, I mean, there's that that's a good, kind of a nice balance. Yeah, and my, my initial approach to using allays was to have them around when I was harvesting mangrove trees, because mangroves obviously generate a lot of leaves, but very few logs in there, and I was silk touching all of the leaves, having allays collect those and throw them into a composter for me, and then I was just focusing on collecting the roots, the sticks that, that dropped occasionally, uh, the propagules, the woods and, you know, a couple of other bits and pieces. So I, I think it's really just about how you want to use them, what makes your life slightly easier, and there's some things that you can cut down on the time it's, it takes for, to do a fairly menial task if you want to use a couple of allays to do it. Let's uh, move on into chunk mail. If you'd like to email the show, the email address is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. Our first email comes in from Jeff S. as a response to a previous episode, the subject being a sand generator. Hey Joel and Johnny, I know this is an old topic, but a few episodes back you were discussing a way to generate sand. My idea for that involves water flowing into gravel and the game giving it a chance to convert to sand, similar to how mud is drained by dripstone and converted into clay. This would simulate real life, where rivers generate sand as they flow and the sediment is deposited at the end, building up as sand. 
I can envision a farm which would detect the change, trigger a sticky piston, pull the sand back over an empty block where it could fall onto a bottom slab and be collected by a hopper. I don't think the setup would be overpowered since it would require a specific flowing water setup, time to wait for conversion and sacrificing gravel. Slightly related, I'd love to see a quicksand implemented, similar to how powder snow works, could be a quote unquote fun new hazard to be aware of in deserts. Thoughts? Love the show, I'm planning to become a patron to support all your great content. My family has grown up in Minecraft watching Pixorifs' survival guide. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff died after falling in a lightning sand pit while running from zombies and rodents of unusual size. Rodents of unusual size? They're probably a retextured silverfish. <laughs> Gross. Yes. Yeah, I don't want silverfish to be any bigger, thank you. That's, <laughs> that's fine, you can, you can keep them. Uh, I like the idea of using water to create sand. I think the farm idea is still painfully slow though, and requiring both the manual placement of gravel and sacrificing gravel itself feels tedious. And granted, gravel is now renewable with the piglin bartering and gravel as a gravity block means that you could stack up quite a lot of it and then leave it in the farm to auto refill and then perhaps become new sand. I just don't know if all that setup and piglin bartering and like getting the gold for the piglin bartering to get enough gravel for all of this is worth it to like, you could, you could just go to a desert and mine it. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it's while it is renewable sand, I, I feel like even traveling to a new desert and getting more sand is still going to be faster than this. So uh, it, like the farm itself sounds like it could be fast enough, but it's the setup. It's the, it's the materials that you need. Um, so I know we've talked a lot about renewable sand in the, in the past episodes that, that Jeff was talking about with like grinding, but maybe the combination of like grinding and water, you know, is something that could be put into renewable sand. Uh, I, I feel like it has, the, the mechanic of, of having renewable sand, I think, has to be more beneficial than just going to mine it on your own. And I keep on coming back to the idea of how glowstone without silk touch gives you glowstone, glowstone dust. Mm -hmm. So maybe there are things in the game that we could end up crafting into sand, but we have to get like piles of sand like a little item in your inventory that you can then later turn into a sand block when you craft it in a crafting bench. I don't know where you get that pile of sand. Maybe it's pulled off of gravel. Like maybe the gravel doesn't disappear. Maybe you have to set up a certain amount of water and a certain amount of gravel. And then eventually you're just going to end up with little piles of sand in your water stream. I don't, I don't know how that might work, but I feel like it would be slower, but it would at least be renewable without the loss of the original material. Maybe something like a sieve, maybe something like the archaeology brush that they were planning on adding with archaeology mm. as a feature in Caves and Cliffs. Um, there's there's a couple of options there for tools that would do it specifically. I think it's it, it just like I like the idea of it being a tactile mechanic, and that's the the selling point really of Jeff's idea. I think the problem with using stuff like flowing water as the catalyst is that flowing water can occur naturally on world generation. And you mm -hmm. think of you don't think of that as being super common because you're used to seeing water on the surface when it's not flowing. But you consider the single water sources you find in caves and how frequently those might flow over a patch of gravel, and then that gravel is going to be converting into sand, and you have this weird patch of sand in a cave. It might actually look kind of cool, but I I do think that if you start to play around with those mechanics, you're also limiting what a player can do with gravel and water together later on right like it's already yeah. kind of annoying when you want to place concrete powder around water and it automatically converts to concrete and you go oh wait no i can't do that silly me um, yeah and yep. and this is why even though it seems kind of unrealistic in terms of what we're used to from real life the player has to use a bottle of water to convert dirt into mud instead of just having a water flow over dirt because it would happen accidentally all the time. Um, and then we'd have mud everywhere instead of dirt, which wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, but you want mud to be something that the player has to either find in a very specific biome or create very intentionally. Um, so I think, yeah, there, there is potentially a lot of different ways that renewable sand can be added, but they have to be in ways which are deliberate to the player's actions and maybe less accidental like stuff like this like you think about the amount of time that you f you find flowing water and flowing lava combining in a cave and thinking oh there's a bunch of cobblestone generating here you'd get that but with weird patches of sand everywhere <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, I, and the intentional design, I think a good example is uh, basalt generators, right? You've got a very mm -hmm. specific block that lava has to flow over next to uh, ice blocks. Like it just, it's very specific. You're not going to yeah. find that in, in natural uh, Minecraft generation. Uh, what do you feel about the quicksand idea, the, uh, the secondary idea here? Hard nope. Hard <laughs> nope. Uh, and to clarify, not not because of the fear factor, it's the annoyance factor. I don't like powdered snow now. If mm -hmm. you have sand do the same thing or similar, I, I can't see it being something that I'm going to be very happy about cruising across the desert in the first days of a Minecraft world only to be sucking quicksand and being unable to get out or frustrated with. There's something I find mechanically frustrating about the you know removal of any movement in, in first person games. And I feel like that's one of the things that I don't like about uh, powdered snow. So the, the quicksand for me would be not of interest unless it is the one way to get renewable sand. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah. think about how uh, crying obsidian drips and how uh, you've got um, water that will drip from a uh, stalagmite or stalactite rather uh, with dripstone, like that kind of a thing. If you had quicksand, and you put a water source over the quicksand and then you eventually got more sand out of that Then I can I can understand the sacrifice of like, well, that's how you get sand, Joel. Now you have to deal with potential quicksand pits in your in your uh, in your Minecraft world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I think um, powder snow and soul sand already have the quicksand mechanics sort of locked down, like for them yeah. to include quicksand, it need to have something different about it because that's one of the things they look for when they add new features in general it, it'll need to be something other than a retexture of powdered snow i do kind of like the idea of quicksand being a way to get renewable sand though like imagine if you have a quicksand pit and maybe there's some way of preventing it from um from falling any further if assuming it's affected by gravity like regular sand is but then if you drop a gravel block through the top it goes through slowly the way it would a cobweb and then when it comes out of the bottom it transforms into sand <laughs> like that's yeah. that's not a bad idea like i don't mind that idea at all i'm <laughs> i'm hoping that uh, something like that again a tactile mechanic can be part of the way we get renewable sand if we're getting it in future and fingers crossed we are because gosh i need renewable sand <laughs> you've no idea yeah like it's it's something that i really hope that they can solve and i and i i like the idea of it being i don't mind it being labor intensive right mm -hmm. um but but i feel like it has to also not be um something that creates the desire for other things to be renewable you yeah, know what i mean yeah, like uh -huh. it, it can't it can't have a, a knock-on effect of making other things really hard to get or oh, well, this is how you make renewable sand, but the ingredients or the process of that is grindy to the point where the player is like, well, now we want this to be renewable or we want that, you know, it's a, it's a tough problem to solve. You know what would be really funny is if they gave us a way to make renewable red sand that didn't include regular sand, so not like sand and dye or something like that, and but oh. suddenly red sand was renewable, but regular sand wasn't, and suddenly red sand went from being that one thing that you don't touch. You don't make glass out of that. It is far too rare for you to be doing that. You make sandstone out of it or nothing, and and then they just gave us that renewably and not <laughs> not the the regular sandstone type of sand. I think that'd be really funny. Interesting, yeah. Or 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 if quicksand was cartoonishly quick, so not not slow in terms of like, because quicksand is not quick, it's slow, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And I, it would be neat if quicksand was just like, you know, something that you could use to, instead of like slowing things down like a cobweb, like maybe mobs that go through quicksand go through it like snot, like just like woof, you know, like right through, even maybe they increase speed. Maybe it's a way to increase the velocity of mobs and, and have fall damage be faster. Yeah, I don't know. Just there, there could be some quirks that they could do to that without you know copying the existing mechanics of um like you said soul sand and powdered snow but yeah absolutely uh so the main discussion this week is something that was actually brought to my mind from uh our um our email inbox and we've got one more to read so we'll uh, fold that into the main discussion why don't you grab this one yeah uh this comes in from paul s and the subject is adopting model railroading philosophy in minecraft it's it's interesting bear with us hi joel and pix i myself am not just an avid minecrafter but also a model railroader i constantly see myself drawing similarities between my real life model railway and the game of minecraft both are a relative sandbox of possibilities facilitate strategic thinking and foster creativity 
Towards the beginning of episode 200, Joel mentioned his struggles regarding spending too much time on an unimportant build. This immediately made me think of a technique that a section of the model railroading community has adopted regarding the prototype weathering of freight cars. While the weathering of these freight cars is truly an art form, the time it would take to weather a full 20 to 30 car freight train of cars would take absolutely ages. This has led some people in the community to adopt a philosophy where rather than weathering the entire freight train, only the first, last, and every fifth car in the train are weathered prototypically, the remaining cars just get a quick, light dusting of grime. In doing so, as a train whizzes by, the more detailed cars catch the individual's eyes, and nine times out of ten they don't even realise the whole train isn't flawlessly weathered. I wonder what your thoughts would be about adopting a similar philosophy for medieval city builds like Joel's. Do you think, by spending a significant amount of time on builds that are on street corners and in the forefront of the city, and using a more cookie-cutter build style for builds in less viewed areas to save time, has some merit? I look forward to hearing what you think. Paul plummeted into a pool of lava after a gas shot out the track on his nether railway. Man, you just can't get away from the railway plights, right? <laughs> <laughs> problems in the real world, problems in the nether, like it just it falls you everywhere. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I thought this would be a fun topic to kind of full, uh, unpack in our main discussions because the devil's really in the details of a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, when building in Minecraft, how much detail is too much? When does the tedium of manicuring every block placement overtake the fun? When do massive build projects cause problems? Like what techniques can the average player use to achieve the desired results while trying to balance the time invested? And because uh, Paul had kind of get, given me like a, a direct shot in the email, um, it's obviously subjective. I mean, like it's based on the amount of satisfaction that you get out of the process up against how you feel the build looks in the end. Do I noodle over almost every block? Y yes, yes, I do. Would I do that if I wasn't streaming and sharing the build? Also, yes, <laughs> that's just, mm -hmm. I'm a perfectionist and I'm a completionist and it takes a lot of time in the end, but it's one of the things that I find satisfying about the game. I feel like uh, it helps me take my time with the builds, which sounds like a strange thing to say, but I'm not up against a clock. Uh, and I find I get more out of my time in Minecraft by taking the time and thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, that said, I also have the ability to walk away from something that is quote unquote good enough or as good as you can get it given the building confines that Minecraft places on you. So I think there has been times in the West Hill build where I've been working on something that is in between or not one of the main builds and I catch myself spending an awful lot of time on it and getting frustrated and then realizing that that frustration is no longer fun and this build doesn't matter as much as say a key build on a corner or something really important or something that has a really fun design that I really quite like. And so I'd be better off from both a time management perspective and from a Joel enjoyment perspective to go and just finish this up, have it be pretty standard and say like, look, not everything in this town has to be wonderful and immaculate. Like, you know, there's going to be little houses that are attached to things and stuff that doesn't really matter uh, that, you know, people are going to walk by in a heartbeat or see very brief briefly when I walk by. Um, that said, I do like the level of completion that I have brought stuff to. And I think that's where, that's where it becomes a personal decision as to how much time you spend on something. Um, so like in terms of how much is too much, like where do you feel? Cause you've been doing some, some very detailed stuff on empires lately. Yeah, and I think the most important thing really is to consider whether your build is intended to be viewed from a distance or explored up close by the player, what your ultimate goal is for the player experience. And this kind of goes hand in hand with me thinking a lot more with this season of Empires about designing an area as an experience for other people and looking at it from an environment design perspective, almost as if I'm making my own game. Um, and so there are areas where yes i'm going to put in a bunch of detail because when up close it's the kind of detail that works it's like the smaller details about a build that make it feel like oh yeah this has been kind of lived in um compared to you know big picture kind of stuff about the shape of things like i, I think once you step back a little further once you're looking at things from a hilltop or from the air 
you start to notice more the bigger picture and the shapes of everything than you do some of that little individual detail like you know the the weathering on every train car right um so is the player supposed to when they're exploring a town like west hill wander into every back alley and shop and if so are you holding their attention enough with other elements that they won't notice or care if they're walking past what is ultimately a flat stone wall like if you give them an objective on the other end of that they'll walk through a featureless hallway to get to whatever the detailed thing is at the end so i'm thinking one of the main things paul's saying here has a lot of merit yeah i think it's it's actually worth having feature builds that you pay more attention to than some of the other stuff but if you have time if you're the kind of person who you like the craft of you know making a lot of these houses individual and if that helps your personal sense of immersion then i think it's worth going into finer detail on some of that stuff um we we see that approach with interiors as well i think this is probably the the experience that most folks can relate to when it comes to larger builds you'll skip doing the interiors of a place where the houses are just there for aesthetics and they don't have any specific function because you know that very few people are going to see the insides of buildings and more often than not it's for the builder's peace of mind and immersion rather than any kind of later audiences um, but in your case, you do the interiors for basically everything that you built in West Hill so far. How does that tend to factor in for you? So for me, the, the interiors are part of the completionist thing. It's part mm. of the uh, finishing the build. Like it's it's part of the complete thought. And I think sometimes it also helps communicate the intention behind the build. The uh, blacksmith that I mentioned earlier is a really good example. You know, granted the... Um, the yard, the forge yard is outside. It's still under a canopy. It's still part of the building. Uh, but the interior with the jeweling station and having a couple tables with some candles indicating that there's a bed, there's more storage in the rafters, you know, where there's more gemstones and, and different crates and things like that all meant to make it look lived in. And that to me, I think helps with my suspension of disbelief that there's someone living here because ultimately there's not npcs walking around like in warcraft you know mm -hmm. there's not someone outside hammering and creating like an anvil dinging noise uh and i think that in order to communicate that i'm using the interiors to do that i'm also you know i'm using a data pack that makes interiors look really cool uh it's very vanilla-esque in its design but you it's not something i could do with stair blocks and pressure plates on on fence posts yeah right? you know like it's it's not, if if that's what i had like if i was on a server where i couldn't control the data packs and there were none i probably wouldn't be doing the interiors i might be mm -hmm. doing things like fireplaces but the chances of me putting furniture and stuff i just i would just kind of like leave it as like minecraft just can't do this not in a way that i'd be satisfied with and and so the interiors for me are a challenge because I was one of those builders in my first few years of Minecraft where I didn't do the interiors or when I did them, I didn't find I did them very well. So I thought, well, here's how you get good at them. Make a town full of them, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, and have to go through that process. And uh, I feel like I've gotten pretty good uh, at it in terms of um, less is more. Like I don't I don't tend to overcrowd them. Um, I, I watch some creators and I don't know how they even know to put these details into every last little corner. But I find sometimes I'll look and say like, that's really inventive and amazing that they've got all this detail on this interior. But then you feel like you can't walk around because you've got one meter of space to walk through a build. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one, it's a, it's a kind of a double-edged sort of like, I really admire the detail and I admire the build, but then like it feels really claustrophobic with all that detail, like right next to your nose. So I find that I take a minimalist approach, but my art has always been like that too. And, you know, getting into like too much detail, I think it's, pretty widely accepted in design and art that every square inch of something is when it's covered in detail then nothing is by comparison sure your, yeah. your eye your eye needs a place to rest similar to a comma in a sentence you know like if if you ever read an email from someone that has no punctuation in it it's really hard to get through mm -hmm. and i think that you know art and design which is how i treat minecraft is very similar and so i try to think about like the you know over texturing giant air quotes um for me it tends to look noisy it's the same thing that i don't like about a texture like if it's a block texture i don't like it's usually because it's too noisy i don't find it's it's easy to discern by the eye and if it looks less intentional if your build is completely covered in detail versus if you've got some sort of rhyme or reason so for me 
much like the interiors, the details that I put both inside and outside, I think about the imaginary reason behind why the build has the details that I'm adding. A good example would be like cracked bricks and a broken down look on the corners of the building, more exposed to the elements versus a part of the building that's maybe sheltered in an alley and maybe a little bit more protected. And then those faces are perfect bricks because they're unscathed. Why would they be? They've just, mm -hmm. they've barely even seen the sunshine, let alone any wind or rain. And I think that that can help players kind of determine where to put the the detail. Uh, now that's more about texture detail, but when you're talking about building detail, too much detail I find can take away from the overall form. So I usually think about like, my structures is a specific shape and then I get into color and block selection and then I get into detail and I always make sure that the detail doesn't overpower the original impression which is kind of like a, a decent silhouette and if you're building something like a, a tall monolithic overpowering structure a bunch of curly cues that you make with stairs and slabs that break the overall vertical lines of that is going to diminish the monolithic effect it's not going to feel quite as imposing if it's got lines going in every direction. If you've got some very key lines that are very clear from the top to the bottom, then it's gonna have a much more lasting effect and stronger effect from your original design concept. One of the things that really brings all of this together is again, like whether you're viewing stuff close up or at a distance, because at a distance, once you're far enough away from a build, you, you think about it like this, a 16 by 16 block build, uh, like a, a a tower, let's say that's like a a perfect cube, um, will just look like a sixteen by sixteen pixel block that you're just looking at from from a different perspective, right? You you find that at a certain distance, your detail becomes texture, which is really when you need to start playing a bit more with shape and thinking about texture more as like like those photo collages that you find where people have taken thousands of photos and chosen them for their color balance or art artificially recolored them and then positioned them so that together they form another larger image um and the like the kind of photo montage effect like that that's how you can approach texturing if you're looking at stuff from a distance and the problem there becomes that this is a sandbox game and the player can in theory go anywhere so you can't really fake some of that stuff so much which is what makes building larger stuff really difficult if you want to cram some detail in is that somebody is going to be able to walk up to every part of this and scrutinize it and you can't just limit their perspective by having that really far away and have an invisible wall there that they can't go past yeah i think that the player's perspective is important too you know, I mean, case in point, this roof that I've been battling with all all weekend, you can't see it from the ground. <laughs> you know, like just you can't see it when you're walking by. You can see the edge of it and you can see a little hint of what color it is on top. But that's it. All the details that I find drive me crazy. Um, you can only see when you're standing on top of it. Yeah, or, or, fl or flying over with Elytra is the other yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I do have some towers that are pretty tall and some taller ones coming. So I'm I, like, I'm trying to think ahead and be like, all right, well, if you can see this from any of those towers, I really don't want it to be an eyesore. So it might it might change. But that's, I mean, that's part of the beauty of Minecraft too, is that if you design something that's kind of, you know, if you, if you left the roof really plain and then later on you design a tower and you're like, oh, I can see the top of this now. I really should go down and maybe put some more time into that. I think that's, you know, that's one of the nice things about going back and forth with this. I've done that with other builds where I've put something in haphazardly. And then the more that I walk by it, I realize, wow, I'm going to be staring at this build like the entire time that I walk down the street. Yeah, I, yeah, I need to, I need to change it to be more interesting than the box with a triangle on it that I currently have in place. Right. Um, and I'll do that too with builds that are, um, where I can't decide on the detail or if I can't decide on something, I'll get it po finished to a point and then I'll move on and knowing that it's not done and walk by it a number of times. And I think that's important to do because if you're walking by it a number of times and you're not noticing it, then maybe it's a part of the build that you don't need to spend as much time on. Whereas if you are walking by it a bunch of times as you build other things in the area and every time you walk by your eye twitches a little bit, then mm -hmm. maybe it's, maybe that's a good indication that you should really for either you know, proper aesthetic, you know, purposes or just your own sanity, <laughs> go, mm -hmm. go fix it. You know, cause it, it's, I feel like that's a good, a good metric, you know, like, does it bug you long-term or is it only bugging you now? And 
I think part of the over detailed trap that I fall into is the frustration of not being able to get it to look right, not being able to do Minecraft, not able, not being able to make Minecraft do what I want it to do. And it's like a challenge. It's like when you get it to look good and you can walk away from the detail, you feel like you've won. You know, like you feel like, mm -hmm. haha, Minecraft, you thought that I couldn't do it, but I can, you know? And I feel like I'll get caught in that trap of like just trying to make it look and work the way that I want it to and then walk away and then realize, and you can't see it anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. And it's, it's more of a personal victory than it is like, I'm not doing it for anybody else. It's more like a, uh, you know, the, the, um, flexing the authority over minecraft <laughs> yeah <laughs> we all yeah. think we have <laughs> show the game who's boss a little bit yeah, yeah. no i think it, it is important to know like you were saying earlier when a build is done allow yourself to move on instead of constantly tinkering with the details of individual builds and i guess in the case of west hill the builds while not undetailed and, and not like that th there's a lot of big stuff there but there's also some smaller houses and those only have a limited amount of blocks that you can change out a few times before you're like I'm just repeating myself now. I'm going around in circles, time to cut loose kind of thing. And yeah. I think instead of constantly tinkering with details like that and demanding that every wall be as detailed as possible, there's some shortcuts you can take. You, you don't like a wall, build something in front of it. You know, cover it with a tree is yeah. is one of my favorite things to do. And obviously people use bushes for detailing and stuff, but like, you know, just grow a, an oak tree and, or an azalea or something like that in front of it. If you don't like it so much, like snip a few of the leaves off like tailor it to something that feels a little bit more like a tree that would naturally grow there and then you don't need to worry about that wall not being detailed because there's something in front of it and that creates depth so that your build feels like it's you know back from the street a little way behind a tree and then there's you know if you're not growing a tree in front of somebody's doorway then it adds more life to the area i think and it, it, it will feel quite natural so i think there's definitely little techniques like that that you can use when if you just want to get rid of it like going back to to paul's like model train analogy here if you have you know if you've decorated the sides of the track so that the train you know the train could go through a tunnel it could have you know there's hedgerows there's trees around the track and that kind of stuff then there are only going to be specific points in that at which you can take a look at the train as it passes from certain angles especially and so that's a way that you can limit the viewer's perspective on it and then they'll only be able to catch sight of occasional details like when this train goes past they see those occasional um you know those occasional weathered carriages because the trees and stuff around the outside are providing some perspective and also masking some areas of it that you don't want to be seeing 100 percent of the time i think that's one of the lessons that i've learned from west hill is leaving enough room between the house and the street for something whether it's yeah. a pile of blocks like crates or chests or you know rocks or something if it's a masonry place or bushes like anything that you can add and it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be super detailed it's just like by adding something in front of the build by creating some layers and some depth you're going to inherently add detail not because the blocks themselves are detailed because it's just more leaf blocks or it's just you know a bunch of stone but it just creates enough geometric detail in minecraft that your eye is not just looking at the flat surface of something because i find that that's one thing that i've Kind of painted myself into a corner with with Westo with most of the smaller builds or the housing builds being player scale. It means that the 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 walls are generally one block thick, and so trying to get detail into that without it looking stripy or repetitive is really difficult. And and you have to kind of like choose your blocks carefully, and that's why it takes so long. Is because I'm taking this kind of minimalist approach, um, and and trying to get the details in. Um, in terms of things like uh, tedium and like the the repetitive stuff, like where where do you find that you balance your gameplay with like the time in versus reward out? I think with Minecraft, I always think that I can go and do something else if things get tedious, and there's always the opportunity to come back mm. to something later, right? Like I know a lot of us want to get these projects done all in one go because it feels weird leaving stuff incomplete and not knowing whether or not you'll come back, but ultimately this is all in service of your own enjoyment and if you're not having fun with stuff you can go and do something else and i think that's really the approach that i tend to take if i get kind of burnt out on one task i'll go to something else i'll go and do something else or i'll find a way of reworking 
like something else into the task that I'm doing. Like, for example, this catacombs build on Empires, I'm working redstone details in because I don't want to spend all of my time there just kind of poring over which colour of stone looks best for the stairs in the alcoves in the far right corner. I want to be able to do something fun with it, and so if I want to give my brain a break from the building and the thinking over of stuff, I can come back to it with fresh eyes after I've done something a bit more technical. Um, that also factors in to stuff like how you're getting the materials, which can be part of the tedium, and which materials you're using especially. Like, you can attest to this having built a medieval city and a modern city. Modern city builds are a grind, because oh, the, yeah. the typical materials that you're using are the ones that create nice, clean, modern shapes, like concrete, terracotta, glass. And they don't have a fully automatic means to acquire them, or if they do, those can be as time-consuming to set up in the short term as acquiring the materials manually. But you've got to consider, am I able to farm a bunch of this? Do I want to set aside some time each week or each month to gather a ton of materials so that I can dedicate specific time to building? Or do I want the grind for those materials to be something that I can use to pace myself with the building side of things? And I think that allows you to pace yourself kind of differently. And it also means, again, a technical project that you can absorb yourself in if you, you know, you're know, you done building at a certain point. I started building stuff with the Great Bridge on Empires using mud blocks a lot. And now I'm building underneath the surface of the lake with mud blocks. I'm taking my time with that. But I realized that I was just going to run out of mud every so often, so I set up an automatic farm for it. And those breaks can give you a bit of time to kind of reset your eyes return to it with fresh eyes and also give you something to do that you know feels like a bit of a break and you can come back to the project later yeah i feel like the grind on west hill has been not so much in the material requirements because a lot of what i'm using is stone and wood and like that's pretty easy to acquire and for me it's more I'll say like the roads, like texturing the roads because it's mm -hmm. very repetitive. The roads are long. Um, I'm all. I also run the the challenge of like having a lot of stone in the road and a lot of stone in the buildings, and then having to make sure that they don't look like they're just one and the same. You know, making the road feel like it stands out differently by having different blocks in it. Um, so I find that's been tedious, and I've been putting it off. Like I, I leave it to the end for a couple of reasons. One, I want to make sure that I have all the buildings in, so that I don't texture the road and then only realize, crap, now I feel like it clashes with that building. So I'm leaving the roads and the paths usually till the end of like a section when like six or eight houses are all done in an area. Then I'll go through and I'll maybe tweak out the roads and make sure that they they've got the right amount of um, stuff. And in some ways, like what we were talking about with layers, like that's sometimes the only way to separate a building from the road is when the building is stone and the road is stone, put a tree there, put a bush there. It's, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the only way to kind of cut it off and make it feel like it's a separate thing. Um, thankfully, the the way that Minecraft kind of shadows the side of blocks artificially in the regular gameplay without shaders uh, can also help with like making the road feel lighter because the, the block faces are facing directly up versus yeah. the the side of a, of a building. Um, when I think about tedious versus like like time in versus reward out, I, the thing that comes to my mind is like a guardian farm uh, or any kind of time where you're clearing out a large piece of of area. So like maybe you're clearing out a piece of the nether, you know, and you've got lava and ghasts and all kinds of pains in the butt everywhere or just the amount of resources and time it takes to clear that kind of water from the top of, of a ocean monument. But at the end, my gosh, do they look cool. Mm -hmm. These giant air chasms in the ocean, you know, with your technical farm grinding away at the bottom of it, creating all this cool stuff for you. Like, I, I feel like there is a balance there. Um, and I go, I go into that kind of stuff knowing it's going to get tedious. Um, but I am one of those players that can get kind of some enjoyment out of like systematically gridding something off and mining it out. I remember when we did our blaze farm and I had to clear out a huge chunk of a nether fortress and the surrounding nether rack. And I just did the grid and just went section by section. But that's a personality thing. Like I think I just kind of enjoy that kind of like 
once once you've got it counted out, it's kind of like brain off and you're just like mm-hmm. plowing through netherrack and you're not really worried too much about it. And there is something I think that's a tip of the hat maybe to Minecraft's gameplay in that satisfying, you know, pop of the block and and the the transition of like there was something here before and now it's not. And then I can create something else in its place. And that in its core, I think, is one of the kind of things that pushes me through some of the tedium. Um, but the other thing I think that for me um is the satisfaction of creating like little surprises around a corner or adding little touches to a build that make it uniquely me versus like, well, there's only so many different ways you can make a guardian farm. There's only so many different ways that you can make, you know, um, a certain type of wall kind of like in Minecraft. So by putting my own spin on it, sometimes that means more work, but ultimately I think like, well, it's worth it to me because it, it's going to make it stand out. You know, the case in point with the armor stand stuff, not fun to do. It's very tedious. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are days when I just have to muscle through. There are days when it goes a lot faster than I expected because everything happens to be on the right axis. Like I can kind of remember um, what I'm doing. The things that I'm doing are very similar. So I don't have to noodle around with trial and error so much. But there are other days, especially on stream, where I'll just be like, man, I'll do this with an armor stand later. I'll do one and then say, this is going to be repeated like six more times to make this uh, fruit stand look good. I'm not doing it right now because mm-hmm. I just, I don't feel like for me, it's too double-edged sword. I don't feel like it's good content, but I also don't feel like going through that rough edge because as a data pack, it's not, I mean, it's cool, but the user interface is not as refined as it should be. And I find that it takes me out of the suspension of disbelief of this little fruit stand. And that's yeah. when I'm just like, nah, I'll do that someday when I just want to be distracted from some something even less fun in business, like my email inbox or something. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you think about designing towns the way people would design towns for like old school 2D RPGs, like, like the Zelda kind of games or whatever, whenever you see a village space there, there are feature builds, there are feature houses there because they are typically the ones that are selling you resources for your quest. And so when you're designing a medieval environment like West Hill, you've got things like a smith, you've got a baker, you've got like a lot of the trades and stuff have houses that can be more kind of feature houses because they can be more representative of the people who live and work there. Whereas a lot of the more residential places are probably going to be a little bit more toned down in terms of the level Mm -hmm. of detail or like they're not going to pop out as much. So going back to Paul's email, I think that's that's a way you can do some of that stuff. You can focus on where the feature houses and professions and stuff are going to be in a town like that. And then you can fill out some of the space in between with smaller places that the player is not supposed to look at as much. An alternative to that is even to come up with like yeah a cookie cutter house that may be still pretty detailed but the kind of thing that you can rotate a few different ways and you can just have it fill space in an area and that can be nice and straightforward to do um i'm going to recommend a couple of external resources for city builders because i've come across some of these recently um the the first that's a little older at this point is townscaper which is on steam it's also available i believe for nintendo switch um this is a a single developer who's come up with more of like a town building toy than a game really but it effectively just allows you to choose a color of a house and just kind of pop it down in this flat empty ocean space um and yeah you you can pop down a bunch of different houses as they connect to each other they start to form a few different shapes and you can effectively create roads between them and like houses will pop up out of the roads the the higher you stack them up and you can create lots of little different shapes with that and it doesn't tend to go any further than that but there are little details that come up as you go that make it quite satisfying and you can use that to plan town structures then maybe you want to choose a specific color that represents a feature house in your Minecraft build, and then you can maybe just say all of the rest of the houses are going to be brown, which just means not going to do very much with these, just make them standard kind of things. Um, One of the other uh, things that I found more recently, uh, thanks to Stephen Reed, Minecraft educator on Twitter, um, there's a guy called Pavel Oliver, uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, um, who had a... um, 
a library plugin for Blender, the 3D modeling software. So this is going to require a little bit of technical knowledge of Blender, uh, but it's called Buildify. And effectively, it allows you to create a node in Blender, which you can stretch out into city buildings. You can just drag walls around and shape them and it becomes a lot easier to create something that auto populates with uh, a city structure. Um, it's, I don't believe some of the visuals that are there in the trailer for it, which we'll link in our show notes, um, I don't think all of those are necessarily native to the plugin. I think they're kits that you have to maybe buy from art asset libraries and stuff. Um, but one of the things you can do with it is plug in uh, real world map data from OpenStreetMap, which you can find at openstreetmap.org, and you can import that into Blender and it will just create a default kind of city plan for you. And in that sense, you can save time in uh, planning a lot of this stuff in terms of the shapes of, of how the houses are going to fit together and what infrastructure they would need, like what road access you would need, that kind of stuff. You can do a little bit more of the, the heavy lifting of that using technology instead of having to sort through it yourself in survival Minecraft as you go. And on that subject, I'm a recent convert to Lightmatica. Um, and while it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea to use it, uh, building stuff in creative and then working from a schematic in survival is a really great way to cut down on the more time-consuming survival build trial and error process. Um, and there are even features like easy placement mode, which automatically cycles the blocks out from your inventory instead of needing to pick block from the schematic to, you know, get the, the blocks out or open your inventory and move stuff around. Uh, so if you're the kind of person who wants to design a bunch of stuff in creative and then just import it wholesale into survival, maybe tweak it a little bit as you go and then build from a blueprint, I think that can save some of the time because in creative mode, swapping blocks around is going to be a lot easier than survival. You can fly around more easily to look at them from different sides and a lot of that stuff can be assisted, let's say, by mods like Lightmatica. And if it's not your bag, then I entirely appreciate that, but I think there can be ways that you can make it less tedious for yourself and still create a certain level of detail that you can be happy with. Yeah, in terms of, you know, larger builds and trying to increase your efficiency, I think you can get a lot of time saved out of repetition. So mm -hmm. things like castle walls, bridge supports, repeating pillars, things that just look the same because they're going to have the same function. And the chances are if they have a heavy function, they're not going to be you know, decorated with ornate carvings every single time. Uh, and I feel like you can kind of hedge your bets, pardon the pun, by adding foliage afterwards. The mm. idea that vines, nature, they always look better, a little bit more random. So by having the exact same block selection in your, you know, 50 columns across the front of your palace, but having a different vine go up each one of them, you're going to make it look very different with minimal effort, right? Yeah. It's not going to be quite quite the same and, and i find that that's usually a good way to go for me if if you're not going the light medical route and if you're not building things in creative first uh, i build wireframes and i just adjust them as needed uh, sometimes it's it's similar to how I, I put down a sketch in a drawing before i put in the final details uh, you kind of work in layers and so for minecraft i just kind of like you know i pick a block that's kind of easy to put up and put down dirt uh, sometimes i'll pick something a little bit more representative representative of the color of what I want to do, like wood roof slash stone bottom. Even if I change them out a little bit later, I still kind of want to have the same rough vibe. I'm not building things that have like neon concrete or wool because it just kind of throws me off. Um, but if you decide that that build needs more, needs less, or needs to not be there at all, tearing down a wireframe in Minecraft takes a minute mm -hmm. versus even just one finished wall. The time that you put to build it and the time it takes to tear down it's still going to take longer than that wireframe. So I find that that's a good way to kind of like meet in the middle between like the light Matica and the, the pre build, you know, creative stuff. It's kind of like, don't just dive in on one corner and start going across your town, like start to think about it from a, a larger perspective and adjust as you go. And being flexible, I think really helps too. Um, one of the things that I've found that has led to some happy accidents in West Hill has been like feeling like I was heart set on having a building there and really liking what I had for an idea and then realizing it just wasn't working. It was causing more problems with everything around it. And sometimes scrapping that idea is the best thing you can do. Uh, it's led to fun little things like tunnels under the road or secret entrances or alleys that I didn't think were going to be there and like all that kind of stuff uh, I find has helped in terms of like my creative process 
when you s start to have a radar for those happy accidents, you can kind of lean into them. And it's, it's a nice flexibility exercise. It's a nice sort of um, way to work past the frustration. When Minecraft gives you a roadblock and you're like, okay, well, how can I pivot from this? It's like a game of yes and. And mm -hmm. I find that if you, can, if you can do that, then you end up being a lot happier with the builds, even though you might have to walk away from the level of detail you can still like, all right, well, yes, I couldn't make this as detailed as I wanted, but in the end, I ended up with maybe a, a, a second layer to your bridge that you didn't anticipate, but it ends up looking better in the long run, even though you had to sacrifice all the detail that you originally had the vision for. And I think that remaining flexible as you go through, especially these larger builds, will save yourself a lot of frustration. Yeah, and it also depends whether you're about the journey or the destination, kind of like, are you happier mm -hmm. with it being like a finished product at a certain stage, or are you really the kind of person who wants to get into the craft of hand shaping every detail about this place, and whatever's going to make you happier, I say go for it. We're going to take the discussion to the people and see what anybody else thinks. If you have a contribution to this discussion, if you want to talk to us about how you build, you can, of course, email the show uh, and you know maybe we'll have a a follow-up to this discussion in a few episodes time for now though that's going to wrap up this episode of the spawn chunks you can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we've talked about today at the spawnchunks.com the music for the show is composed by me and the spawn chunks is proud to be a listener supported podcast if you're getting some value out of the show why not consider putting some value back in you can visit patreon.com slash the spawn chunks to join our community pledging at any level gets you an invite to our patrons only discord chat and you can participate in things like listening to to the live show recording having our monthly minecraft audio hangout where people from the community share their builds with us and we talk about what we've been seeing in terms of trends in the community and that kind of stuff we're currently at 353 patrons which is up four from last week thank you so much to the four of you who have hopped on board and special thanks to our content engineer patrons hunter555 jumbo sale and yitz for your support on this episode Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram. Personal recommendations are by far the best way to share the podcast. Just tell a friend about The Spawn Chunks and that they can listen on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, really wherever you can find a podcast, even YouTube. Be sure to leave us a rating and a review on your favorite platform. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. The RSS feed is linked on the spawnchunks.com and the patron-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to the Render Distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixel Riffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash pixelriffs, where I try to make sense of this bizarre and wonderful game in Season 2 of the Minecraft Survival Guide and Empire's SMP. I also stream three days a week on Twitch, where I do behind-the-scenes work for the aforementioned YouTube series, and I'm the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search. Aside from that, I'm at Pixel Riffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything I'm up to, including my illustration and design portfolios at joelduggan.com. You can find out more about my uh, other podcast at thecitadelcafe.com. That's one about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. I'll be talking with Stephen ESC this week about the Marvel news coming out of San Diego Comic-Con this summer. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream at least three days a week from the Citadel. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite and the weather is in the detail. Mm -hmm.